and please be seated. <laughs> you know, in the church, we are always at a lot. We are always good to go. We are always ready. It is always stand up, <coughs> sit down, stand up. It is because we are healthy. Let us clap our hands for Jesus. And with that, this morning, I want to welcome everyone here to this special Sunday service. Today is a children's Sunday throughout the world, and our children will be ministering to us at the first part of this uh, service. And at the second part of this service, uh, our father, Reverend uh, McNath, will be speaking to us. We are grateful that he's here with us this morning with his uh, beautiful wife and uh, uh, their family and all the church. Thank you. And again, I want to thank you for being here. Please, this morning, I know you are going to experience the glory of God. Open your heart and prepare yourself for the manifestation of the glory of God. Today is Christ's reign Sunday. And before the end of the service, what will happen next Sunday? I'm going to let you know. Let me invite Angela for announcement. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Morning, everyone. Morning. Um, we have a few announcements. Um, and they're in the back of the bulletin if anybody wants to read them, and anybody online. So this is what's going on. Uh, Wednesdays, we have Youth Group with a Purpose from 6 to 7. Choir Practice at 7.15. It's the Christmas Cantata. Handbells is every Sunday after church until Christmas. Um, Bible Study is on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 until November 16th. And then Advent, which is, I think, this week, I believe. It, Advent Bible studies from November 23rd until December 21st from 1 to 2. Books are available in the church. And there's other things outside the church. If you want the upper room, the gift of vision, the daily bread, the United Church calendars are $10. First Sunday of the month is Food Bank Sunday. Um, stewardship seconds, the kingdom of God is within you. Please share it, spread it, and live it. And then on the back, we have um, the Salvation Army Christmas Kettle Campaign. campaign. Um, that's dates are December 1st, 8th, and 15th from 10 until 8 p.m. Sign-up sheet is on the outside of the office. Uh, next week is our first Sunday of Advent. We have communion, and we also have the Palmer family. Uh, the, November 29th. Uh, that's meetings. We have session meetings on the 29th, I think it's at 615, and then official board and all the other other committee meetings. Um, so December is going to be busy. <laughs> it always is. So the 4th is White Gift and the Kirk service at 7 o'clock. The 11th is the uh, Christmas cantata, and the 12th is the cantata again at 7 o'clock, followed by desserts. Uh, the 13th, we have our meetings. Uh, the 18th, we have the Sunday School Concert and Family Christmas Potluck. And then, of course, December 24th is Christmas Eve service with communion. December 25th, because that lands on a Sunday, right? Okay. So service will be at 1030, and New Year's Eve service is from 11 to 12. And I believe that... Is it? I didn't see any donations. Oh, just keep in mind, too, please, that we are a scent-free church. We have uh, quite a few people that have severe allergies and uh, medical issues, and they cannot attend because of the scents. And so just keep bear that in mind. And I believe that is it. So we are going to start with our introit on Voices United, um, page 400.
morning. Let's take our call to worship. We call out to God for help. We call out to God for new life. We call out to God for God's love and mercy. Come, let us worship God. Loving God, we, loving God, we thank you for friends who, by loving us, remind us of what it is to be loved by you. We thank you for, for the church and all of the many ways we experience your love in this place, that we might go from here ready to share your love with others. Amen. Our opening hymn right now is Voices United, 577, Peace Like a River. Prayer of approach and confession. Often people know that the more things change, the more they stay the same. This short reading from the prophet Her Her Habakkuk reminds us that living in God's world at any time can be challenging. Hear these words, and as you do so, reflect on the world which it, we live today. How do these worlds apply? How can God help you break out of the cycle that the passage speaks of? Let us all read together from the passage of Habakkuk, chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Words of insurance. God hears us when we cry. God sees us when we throw off our hands in despair. And God responds with forgiveness, justice, hope, justice, hope and with a new life. Amen. Amen. So we're moving on to celebrations. Um, I have a few here. And if, and if anybody has any celebrations, I'll get to you after I read this. <laughs> so uh, Gail Lipsitz's uh, birthday is today, so happy birthday, Gail. And Heather Vauture had a birthday a couple of days ago. I see her, where do I see her? There she is. When was it, Thursday? Yesterday. Yesterday, okay. Happy birthday. So the flowers in front here are placed in the sanctuary today in honor of the 100th birthday of Kay Shear on November 21st by her sons John and David and daughter Nancy and their celebrations. So we definitely want to wish Kay a happy birthday. So does anybody else have any celebrations? 
behind me. It's not so much a celebration as it is a moment of gratitude to the two young men at the very back of the sanctuary that have been key journalists and the experience that we're having together as international students here in Carleton County. So we're celebrating that. Okay, so we're celebrating our exchange students. Oh, okay. I have a small celebration. I want to celebrate people that will step up to the plate and help out. We have a number of sick kids today, and I want to thank Faith, who willingly offered to help us out. And I want to thank Shelly, because Friday night I arranged a little pizza party here, and I got to have all the fun, and she stayed in the kitchen and cleaned up. So we want to celebrate Shelly's help. Thank you. <laughs> And do we have any other celebrations? Nope. Okay. We will sing our song. Congratulations to you. May Jesus be praised. May God reach us blessings. Abide unto you. So we're moving on to the children's hymn, um, Voices United 585, Jesus by Bids a Shine. Scripture sharing Luke 19 to 1 to 10. Introduction to this passage that is often misread, excuse me, or misinterpreted. The story of Zacchaeus has traditionally been understood in a certain way. That Jesus encounters this wee little man, and after a conversation, Jesus, Zacchaeus, the wicked tax collector, repents of what he has done wrong and becomes a changed man. It makes for a nice, comfortable story, and we are able to celebrate that a person who has done things wrong finds their life turned around by Jesus. Except that's not what the story in its original Greek really says. Verse 8 is usually translated in the future tense, and thus has Zacchaeus saying, I will give half my belongings to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I will pay back four times as much. However, in the Greek, the verbs are present tense and thus imply that Zacchaeus already does this. I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anyone, I repay them four times as much. This can make a huge difference and suggests that perhaps the real change in this story is not that Zacchaeus goes back from bad to good, but rather that the crowd goes from assuming he is bad to realizing he is good. In other words, the intervention of Jesus is not to change Zacchaeus, but instead to change the minds of people who have been judgmental and exclusive. Let us keep ourselves open to this understanding as the Sunday School presents their learning of the gospel to you.
Look at him. Tax collectors are such rip-off artists. And he's the chief. I wonder how he got to be chief. He's working for the Romans. They're the enemy. Yeah, he's always charging too much. Poor people can't pay those taxes. I don't know how he can live with himself. He must be very lonely. No one really wants to talk with him, let alone eat with him. Look, here comes Jesus. What is he doing? Who is he talking to? Come down, Zacchaeus. Me? You want to talk to me? Come down. I want to have dinner with you. Don't go with him, Jesus. Don't go into his house. Don't go with him, Jesus. These people think they know me, but they don't. Jesus, you know what kind of person I am. You know what I, I am inside. I'm not perfect, but I know what but well, I give half of my goods to the poor. If I ever overcharge anyone, I always give back the money twice, three, three, four times over. I want to live in God's way. Help me to see and understand as God does. I have come to seek and to save what was lost. Today, loneliness has come to this house. You know, I've never seen him give away <laughs> half of his money. Do you think, perhaps, maybe all tax collectors aren't cheaters? Maybe we haven't seen who he really is. Why don't we go ask him to lunch? So, I have a few things here. I want people maybe to tell me what they think they are. What is this? Magnifying glass? How does that help us to see things? It makes them bigger. It makes things bigger, okay. Here I have, Luna, what are these? What kind of glasses? Are they sunglasses? How do you think sunglasses help us see better? <coughs> well, if I'm driving a car and the sun's coming in my eyes, I'll be out of a telephone pole if I have a pair of sunglasses on. What are these? Binoculars. Binoculars. Trust the eye doctor to know what binoculars are. <laughs> he wants to see further away. They help us to see things that maybe are a long ways away. So in our story today, Zacchaeus was very short, and he wanted to see over the crowd. So he climbed a tree. He went to dinner with Jesus, and they talked for a long time. The things that Jesus said about love, sharing, and concern for other people made Zacchaeus think about his own life. Just like climbing up that tree gave him a different view of Jesus, listening to Jesus' words was giving him a different view of his life. I have a lot of money that I'm able to share with poor people, he told Jesus, and when I make a mistake collecting taxes, I give back four times what I took from them. Jesus smiled and said, you are learning about living in God's way. The townspeople were learning too. They saw Zacchaeus differently now that Jesus was his friend. Sometimes, if we could look differently at the bullies in school or people who are not so clean and hungry, not the same color or ethnic as us, maybe we could put on our binoculars and try to see them in a different way and learn to be kind, listen, and share what we have with others. We'll discuss this further downstairs, but some things what I want that I wonder about and we will talk about, maybe the congregation can be thinking about as well. 
I wonder why Jesus chose Zacchaeus to have dinner with. I wonder how the community will act towards Zacchaeus now. And I wonder how we can be like Jesus in our community. So if you'd all join me for a small prayer before we go down to Sunday school and repeat after me. Transforming God, Transforming God. Help, us to be changed help us to be changed by your loving acceptance of us. By your loving acceptance of us. Help, us to welcome help us to welcome those we find hard to welcome. To love those we find hard to love. To accept those we find hard to accept. And to be faithful Christians in our time. Amen. Let us clap our hands for the choir. We want to appreciate uh, Debbie and Shelley and uh, Angela for their intense work with our children. Their effort in teaching all these children the things of God, I know, will not go in vain. When I was young, some people taught us at the Sunday school. And I've had some of you that also told me that when you were growing up, you attended Sunday school in the morning, in the afternoon, and sometimes you were in the church in the evening. So I want us to support uh, the, our children church uh, by letting all our children at home come to the Sunday school. Let us tell others. We have vibrant teachers that are ready to teach our children. They were here yesterday, uh, sorry, Friday night, putting all this together. And I miss their pizza because I love food. I miss it. But I told them next time, I will not do what? I will not miss that. Yeah, before we read, the word of God this morning and do some other things. Our Father Reverend Bob McNath will be preaching to us this morning. And I would quickly like to introduce him to us. I know some of us know him by seeing. And we arrived in this church over nearly three years ago and uh, I've been seeing him around. But I didn't know that he's a uh, 
He has a rich life, rich ministry, rich family life like this. Myself and my wife, we have visited him and uh, his wife in their beautiful house. I must tell you that they, are, they welcome us, they encourage us uh, with their word of experience in ministry, not only in ministry and also in life. Reverend Bob might not retire 41 years, after 41 years in ministry. He's married to Sandra. They have two adult children, Pastor Rob McNaught and Mrs. Angela Sneer. They have six grandchildren. Pastor Rob served 21 years at St. Val Baptist Church. And while discussing with him during our visit, I can glean that uh, he's also a Bible scholar and teacher. And if I'm right, I think he taught at a New Brunswick Bible University. Uh, we have a privilege of having Pastor Bob McNutt amidst us this morning. Church, I would like us to stand up while we welcome him and let us clap our hands for Jesus as he step forward. Please, church, let us stand up to welcome him. Is it on? I think so, yes. Thank you, Pastor. Well, it's nice to be with you this morning. I've enjoyed the fellowship in the church here and in the pastor and his fellowship. He's a brave man, you know, to invite a Baptist pastor into the pulpit. Uh, I'll put you at ease a little bit because this just pulls me back to my childhood, listening to the hymns that we sang at Trinity United Church in Onslow, Nova Scotia. That's my background. Uh, raised in the church for the earlier years. My first Sunday school teacher was my mom, and she taught me the catechism. Do you remember those little catechism books that we had back in those days? And if I remember correctly, and this is a long time ago, the first question is this, who is God? And the answer, God is my heavenly Father. And so we had uh, some early experience in the church, Lots of good times. If I close my eyes, I can tell you where the different people sat in our congregation. Our family pew was right around there because in those days you bought your pew and my grandfather had purchased the pew. That's where we always sat. A fellow by the name of Kenny Crow sat down here. He chewed tobacco. <laughs> <clears throat> and it was interesting because we always waited because he would chew and chew and chew, and then we waited for the big ta-da, because he always swallowed it. Mrs. Langell sat back here. Mrs. King sat here. I did have a little experience in Boy Scout, not too successful. We didn't have a lot of money, so I was not able to have the full outfit. Uh, I did enjoy, in particular, the evening that we learned how to do knots, however and we tied up our scout instructor and left him in the bell tower. <clears throat> I don't think I was invited back after that. But fond memories and good foundation. Uh, christened in the United Church, uh, had the children christened there, made some commitments to God that I didn't know really what I was doing, but God certainly knew, and he was faithful to that, to bring us to faith in Christ and also uh, allow us to serve him. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we're going to be in Luke's Gospel, Luke chapter 15, and it ties in quite well with some of the material that the children helped us with already. The Gospel of Luke. It's the Gospel of Prayer. Six occasions not recorded in any other Gospel where Jesus prayed. He prayed at every great event in his life at his baptism, at his uh, first contest with the Pharisees, when he chose the Twelve, when he questioned them about their understanding of his person, at his transformation on the cross during Peter's testing. And then, of course, Luke has the only uh, parables on prayer, one a friend at night and the other one the unjust judge. So it's a, a gospel of prayer. 
It's also a gospel of women. Uh, the women in particular responded to the Lord. You'll understand this, that there's not one statement in the scripture where a woman had a negative word to say about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Luke mentions many of them. Mary and Elizabeth and Nana and Martha and Mary Magdalene, the weeping daughters of Jerusalem, the widow of Nain, the women who anointed his feet. God, through Christ, is always very open to women. It's the gospel of praise. Praise God more than any other, uh, more often in Luke's gospel than all of the New Testament combined. So it's a gospel of praise and a gospel of hymns, five hymns in this gospel. It's the gospel of the Holy Ghost, mentioned 11 times, and Luke elaborates on that in the book of Acts by mentioning the Holy Spirit 42 times in the book of Acts. But his real emphasis is this. I want you to look at the man, Christ Jesus. Matthew says, I want you to see your king. Mark says, I want you to see your servant. John says, I want you to take a good look at God. But uh, Dr. Luke says, I've done this extensive examination and gathered from folks that knew him, and I want you to see the man, Christ Jesus. And so we'll experience him in this passage. We're at Luke chapter 15 and verse number 1. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and the sinners, all the Zacchaeuses, all the tax collectors. Not a particular popular group, by the way. These folks bought their franchise from the Roman government, and Rome, once they got their money, didn't really care too much about what these tax collectors did. And so you'll understand this, they bumped the ante up and collected as much as they could. They were not favorite people in that culture, and of course sinners, those that have come short, can't meet the standards, can't come up. Now the interesting thing is they want to gather around the Lord. They're attracted to Christ. And then there's another group, and the Pharisees. It literally means the separatists. And the scribes, those that are very particular about the scriptures, and they murmured. Murmur, 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 you sort of hear them rumbling underneath. They traveled and followed the Lord through all of his ministry. Here's what they said. This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Well, there's nothing here but sinners. So if you're going to have lunch, you have to have lunch with a sinner. And he spends time with them, and they don't like that at all. And he spake this parable unto them, saying... Now, the word parable is very similar to uh, the Proverbs in the Old Testament. The Proverbs are just little short statements. The parables are more elaborate and longer. Para, beside, balo, to throw down. So something placed besides something else for contrast and comparison. Some people divide this parable up. I think it's all one parable. I think he does some uh, work to bring some tension into the conversation, and then he follows with the truth of the illustration. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say unto you likewise, Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than ninety and nine just persons. So you can feel the tension there, and of course this is an agricultural uh, nation, and they understand about the value of sheep. One out of a hundred, that's perhaps maybe not bad odds, but if you're a shepherd, you're not interested in losing one of them, and you have this tremendous burden to keep these sheep, keep them safe and keep them healthy, and so this shepherd leaves and seeks out and finds that, that one sheep. Either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? This piece of silver perhaps maybe was part of a necklace that she had around her neck and very possibly related to her engagement. 
And so to lose a piece of that would be a statement of unfaithfulness or disregard for the commitment that she's made. So you can understand that she's very, very concerned about getting this back. When she had found it, she called up her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels over her, of God over one sinner that repenteth. So one in a hundred, that's significant, but one in ten. That bumps it up considerably, much more important. And then he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto him all his living. Not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country, some people believe that he's in the region of uh, the Gadarenes, in a region which dominated by Gentile and paganism. And there he wasted, he winnowed his substance in riotous living. That's an interesting phrase. It literally means in unsaved living. That's what a product is. Someone that doesn't save anything. They just waste it, they winnow it, they let it slip through their fingers. And that's what's taking place here. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a certain of that citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. Now, I, my theory on this is this is a young Jewish man, and not particularly fond of being around pigs at any time in his life. Down on my uncle's farm, we had some pigs that he raised, and we enjoyed them, quite frankly. We had a lot of fun. If you could catch them when they're laying down, you could get on their back and you could go for a merry ride, a short one, mind you, but a ride. They would run hard and fast, and then they would stop, and then you would keep going, and they would deposit you where they deposit other things, and when you went home, your grandmother said to you, you stink. Go change your clothes. And this young fellow's down here with the swine, with the hogs. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. Now here's an important phrase. And when he came to himself, when the glow was gone, when he sobered up, when the drugs started to wear off, when rationale returned, that's an important time in someone's life, when he came to himself, some self-awareness, an awareness of the environment around him, and remembering where he came from, whether it's in the United Church or some Baptist church or some Anglican church or some Jewish synagogue, he starts to remember his background and his heritage and his family and the people that loved him and cared for him. How many hired servants in my father's house have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And that's the right order, by the way. His transgression is first before God, and then to his father and his family and violated that first decalogue of the commandments that ends with the responsibility, starts with the responsibility to God, ends with the responsibility to the father. Honor thy father and thy mother because that's the first promise, commandment with promise. He says, I'm no more worthy to be called a son. Make me as one of your hired servants, as one of your day servants, who come in, do their job, get paid for that day, and go home again. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion on him and ran and fell at his neck and kissed him. Don't you like that verse? He's a long way off. He's hardly recognizable. 
He doesn't smell good. He doesn't look good. He's emaciated. He's thin. He's not the young fellow that left the home. And the dad sees him a long way off. And I thought about that. When I was a boy, I used to stand in the bedroom and have the window open, and I would listen for my dad. He would walk 13 miles to work and walk back home again. And so he worked shift work, so sometimes it was very late at night, and we'd be, I'd be listening carefully. He had a distinct walk. He always wore army boots, and on the heels of his boots, he wore these clickers. Uh, young people wouldn't recognize those, but some of you know what I'm talking about. And uh, I would hear him walking, and then I would see him walking, and I could identify him by his stature, by the way he walked, by his gait, watching and waiting. And this dad knows his boy, and regardless of the shape he's in, when he sees that young fellow coming down the road, he knows this is my son. And he rose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him. That's a great word. It's the word that we get our, our word spleen from. And the reason why they used it in this culture is they understood that the spleen was the area where you could feel the most pain, terrible pain. So they reasoned from that 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 must be the place of emotion and love. And so when he had compassion on him, he had the, the greatest empathy that he could have, and he ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him, showered him with kisses. The other time it's used when uh, the lady came and got down on the Lord's feet and showered him with kisses. That's the term that's being used here of the father for the son. And he said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to the servants, these are different kinds of servants. These aren't the day laborers. These are the bond servants. These are folks that lived in the home and made a decision in their life because of the master was so good and so gracious that they became doulos or bond slaves. And hearkening back to that Old Testament principle, if they were to be set free, they would say, I love my master and I do not want to go out free. So they would walk to the doorpost, they would put an awl through their ear and be nailed to the post and they would be committed to that family for the rest of their life. They were bond slaves. And of course that's a, a definition for even us as believers today, we're bound to him because of his love. Bring forth the best robe. <laughs> the best robe. Put it on him. And put a ring. Put a signet ring. Not only the, uh, the sign of sonship, but the authority of the home. The right to act on behalf of his father. The right to exchange and do business. And shoes on his feet. And slaves don't wear shoes in this culture. Bring hither the fatted calf, the stalled calf, the grain-fed calf. So you have to ask and answer this question. What's that calf doing there? It's in reserve. He's waiting for the boy to come. And he's preparing for that day. And he takes this animal and sets it aside and prepares and fattens it up and He's waiting for that great feast, that great celebration that he's hoping one day will take place. And let us eat and make merry. For this my son was dead. This is emphatic in the text. And is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Just think about the celebration. Now the elder son was in the field and he came and drew nigh onto the house. And he heard the music, and it's the word symphony, the music, lots of good music back then. And the dancing, and that's choreography. And I know 
uh, Pastor Ben likes to dance, and rightly so, because when your heart's full of the joy of the Lord, you not only want to make good music and sing, but a little dancing's not bad either. So they sang and they danced, and it was quite a celebration. But this elder son wasn't too keen on that. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, because he have received him safe and sound. Safe and sound. I love that term. And he was angry. Our English word orgy comes from this. A violent reaching forth. He was just red hot angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou hast never given me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. Now watch this young fellow's voice dripped with contempt. But as soon as thy son was come, which devoured thy living with harlots. Now, we weren't given that information prior to this. Somehow he had some knowledge of where his brother had been and the lifestyle he had embraced. You've killed for him the fat calf. Said unto him, Son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet, it was right, it was appropriate that we should make merry and be glad. For this thy brother was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he is found. The parable, the parable of the lost and found. Souls of men, why will ye scatter like a crowd of frightened sheep? Foolish hearts, why will ye wander from a love so true and deep? Was there ever kindest shepherd half so gentle, half so sweet, as the Savior who would have us come and gather round his feet. For the love of God is broader than the measure of man's mind, and the heart of the eternal is most wonderfully kind. Tenderly the shepherd o'er the mountain cold goes and brings his lost one back into the fold. Patiently the owner seeks with earnest care in the dark and dust, her treasure so very rare. Lovingly the Father sends the news around, he once was dead, now liveth, was lost, but now it's found. Now let me just suggest a few things I'll get you to think about quickly uh, before our time whips away too far on us. Uh, the diversity, I thought the first thing was this, the diversity of multi-parenting. He had two sons. Now, I have a brother. We were raised in the same home, a very small home. We slept in the same bed. My sister slept in the same bed, and when mom and dad weren't getting along, which was fairly often, mom would join us in that bed, and that, they don't even make those size of beds anymore. They're pretty small. She would brace her leg on the edge of the bed to stay in with the other, other children, and then later my younger sister came along, and that was, that was a crowd in the small house. But my brother and I are radically different. He is the handsome, the tall, the kind, the compassionate, the obedient son. And you just have a look at me and you know that I'm the opposite of that. And my mom had a very interesting thing, a couple of things. Number one, she had this idea that if someone was acting up and she wasn't sure who it was, she would beat us all so that she'd get the right person. <laughs> and many times I would be back in that pew back there and I'd be squirming and twisting and touching the fur coat of the lady in front of me and, and just kind of making a nuisance of myself. And when we got home, we had this large kitchen the sink, and, uh, kitchen sink, one of those old iron ones that were covered with enamel. And mom would strip us off and stand us in the sink and give us a bath. And while her hands were wet, and while your backside was wet, she would leave an impression on you that would be lasting and stay with you for some time. She had large hands. I only had a small 
backside. Good coverage back then. If we got in trouble, mom would come out and she'd say something like this, don't run or I'll give you a licking. And my brother would stop right still and he would wait for his medicine and she'd get to him and feel so compassionate for him. He never did get the licking. I ran every time. <laughs> and every time I got the licking. But the issue here is this. Two sons. Treat it totally the same. And they go in totally different directions. And this youngest fellow, he's entitled to his inheritance. Nothing wrong with that. And he's entitled to use it as he wills. Nothing particularly wrong with that. But he wastes it. He's the, he's the prodigal. He's the winnower. He's the wasteful son. And gets in great trouble as a result of that. And then the decision that's most painful in homes. Some of you have experienced this. What's that painful decision? You've got to let them go. Eventually they grow up. They were in Sunday school. They took all the training. They learned the lessons in your home. And they came to the age where they were ready to flee the nest. And that's a hard decision. I remember the year I took my son to Bible college in the U.S. We drove all the way down to Washington, D.C., and he jumped out, met a couple of friends, started playing basketball, and I went down into the room that I was staying in and bawled myself to sleep. It was very difficult because his sister had gone to university, and now he was gone, and we didn't have any children home anymore. That's a painful decision and especially painful if they're going in a direction that you're not too happy about and you can't do much about. The darkness that must have prevailed in his life, the waste, the wantonness, the homelessness, the hunger, the humiliation. He said, I have sinned. That's an interesting phrase that appears ten times in the scripture eight times in the Old Testament and two times in the New Testament. And one is Judas in the New Testament and this prodigal. I have sinned against God and against my father. That's a dark experience. Goes to the dogs and eats with the hugs and then home he jogs. Dark, dark, dark. I thought about the depth of this man's perseverance. I call it his dauntless perseverance. He willed for him. He watched for him. He prepared for him. I'll guarantee you that he wept for him. And he hoped for him. And he waited. And we're not given the time frame. Sometimes it's a long time to see one of them come home. We've just experienced that in our family. Over 28 years before one of the children, Sandra's daughter, came home. Called her mom and said, I, I need your help. I want to I talk to you. She said, Jesus has come back into my life. And the other Sunday, she got up for the first time in almost 28, 29 years. Actually, she used to come here to this church. And she went to church on her own. Brave young lady. Then she got talking to a good friend then after church and discovered that she was raised in church too and was living a life that was sort of like this prodigal's life and they talked about these things and she's joined her this morning going to church. There's something going on there. We're so thankful for it. The perseverance. Waiting, watching, hoping, praying. Trusting. That's got to be part of the equation here. You don't make these elaborate preparations if you don't believe that it's possible. 
Someone asked me recently where I was preaching, uh, what's the point for the congregation? Well, the point is this. Some of you have sons and daughters and grandchildren, and they're a long way out there. And you don't know where they are, and you don't know what condition they are. And a friend of mine, a pastor, said to me one time, I don't know where my son's at. And I said, well, the Lord knows where he's at. The Lord knows where he's at. And we'll just, we'll just trust the Lord to find them and to bring them home. This display of manly passion. This young fellow has the scent of harlots and the stench of hogs. And this dad goes and embraces him and kisses him and dresses him and reinstates him. He doesn't even allow the young fellow to finish his confession. The boy gets this out. I've sinned against God. The dad cuts him off. Not going to worry about our relationship now. You're, you're back home. We'll look after that. The disdain manifests for the prodigal, the older boy. He's been faithful on the farm. He's never transgressed. But the trouble is he has tremendous animosity towards his brother. You never killed a calf for me. You never gave a party. We didn't have any dancing and we didn't have any music for me. He's enraged with his dad. Won't go in. Won't attend doesn't want to have anything to do with it. Terrible disdain. Enraged. I think there's the destiny of moral principles here. See, the young fellow spent all of his money, which means he didn't have any left. And the only money left in the home would be the resources that the older boy has, and part of that includes his dad's care over the years. That was appropriate. The older son got a double portion, but he was responsible for his dad. So the moral principle is this. Love is unqualified from the father's perspective. Position is never lost. I need to say this. A son is a son is a son. And one of the deceptions that comes to you when you got out of the father's house and you've been running your own agenda, the enemy will sell you on this. You're not a son. You don't belong. You can't go home. It's not true. It's not true. He's still the father's son. He's still recognizable. And he's on his way home. That which is wasted can never be regained. We understand that. He's not going to get that back. But that which is given can never be taken away. It's always right to rejoice. You cannot rejoice with sinners unless you are in tune with the Father's heart. You may be lost, you may be out there, but you're loved. You may be dead, but you can live. Your life may be a wreck, but you can repent. You ha may have been gone a long time, but you can always come home. Finally, I would say this. There's a decision that's still pending. A decision that's still pending. Remember the tension? You have these two groups. One that want to draw near and listen and hear and understand what the Lord's saying. And another group that just simply want to criticize and, and, and abuse him because he's eating and drinking with sinners. So the tension's created. And now we have the teaching about the Father's heart and about the Father's house. Now here's the lesson. You can get lost out there in the wilderness. We understand that. It's quite easy to get lost out there. But here's the danger. You can also get lost on the farm. You can get lost just by staying home because you're not in tune 
with the Father's heart. And sometimes we spend a lot of energy thinking about those that got lost out there. And we, sort of <laughs> we sort of miss sometimes that we can get lost even within the household. Oh, it was a better and scared than the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks, he cried. Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, then two, only two. Two dollars, and who'll make it three? Going for three. But no, from the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the ball. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening its loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as the caroling angel sings. The music ceased and the auctioneer in a voice that is quiet and low said, now what am I bid for the old violin? And he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars and who'll make it two? Two thousand and who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice. And going and gone cried he. Well, the people cheered, but some of them said, we do not understand. What changed its work? Where as quick came the reply? The touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune is scattered and scarred with sin. Is auction cheap to a thoughtless crowd, much like that old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once. He's going twice. He's going and he's almost gone. Ah, but the master comes. And the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the chains that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. If you'd have been in Trinity United Church when I was a little boy, I would have been that boy that you didn't want in your Sunday school class. <laughs> I would have been that disruption. Folks would have said, he's not going to make it. He's not going to accomplish anything in his life. And by the way, that was said of my son who grew up in my home. And uh, the guidance counselor in his high school said, this young fellow will never go to school, never go to college, won't amount to anything because he's just acting up in class and he's always trying to entertain. I'll tell you this, that boy has a bachelor's degree. He has a master's in theology. He has another master's degree. He's pastoring a church in Maryland in the U.S., Southern Maryland, which is one of the fastest growing churches in the area. See, you can't discount the Father, and you can't discount his heart for those that are lost and out there. And I just believe this. I think there's lots of folks coming home during these days. Some of them are going to land back here in your church. And you're going to say, where have you been? But we're some glad you're home. We've been waiting and watching and working and praying and hoping. So this is the, the parable of the lost and found. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your goodness and grace in all of our lives. Thank you for any measure in which we understand how loving a Father that you are. We just, we just declare it. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. We ask that you would forgive us our trespassers as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. We recognize that you're in charge of this universe. Yours is the kingdom and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Thank you.
if you know the song, you can sing it. To follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Let's sing it together once again. Decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back Let's clap our hands for Jesus. I asked her, did I got it right? She said yes. Those songs we do sing and we continue to sing is I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. When we sing it, we cry. Not only crying, it's a cry from our heart because we want the touch of God. And during the song, we were touched. Thank you, Pastor, for that. Uh, message. Church, let us clap our hands for our pastor. And with that, I would like to take our offering today. One of our commitment is our offering. Maybe you call it tithe, maybe you call it donation, maybe you call it special offering. You can give by e-transfer, by part that is monthly remittance, you can give through your envelopes. You can give by e-transfer. And you can also give by a donate button on the church website. I want to encourage us, if you have been given, to please let us give more. If you have not been given, please let us give. Uh, we need your money. <laughs> we need what? Your money. Please give. Let me invite my daughter, uh, Timilade, to please come forward and lead us in uh, the... Of our three prayers. She said, Daddy, can I pray? I said, Yes, you can pray. Okay. Dear God, you envision a world where the hungry are fed and strangers are welcome. We bring you our gifts to share in the vision. With your blessings, may you have gifts bear fruit in Christ's name and offer his blessings to those we serve. For we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. <coughs> And please, at this time, let us bring ourselves into the presence of God. Let us present our personal request before God at this time. Present your personal request before God at this time. I think I'll pray from the heart, from my heart, not from the book. Let us pray. We thank you, our dear Jesus, this morning because you are God. We want to bless you because there is none like you. Thank you because your word is yea and amen. We thank you for the word that you have sent to us this morning. Thank you for all our family, friends, and everyone. Thank you for all our church members. Thank you for those that have traveled, that have returned. Thank you for those that are on their journey. Thank you for those that are visiting. Thank you for all our new members. Thank you for our whole members. Thank you for our Friends, wherever they might be, we give you praise. Lord, at this time, we remember some of our church members who are sick or who need your touch one way or the other. We remember Han Murray, Lloyd Robinson. We pray for Joyce Totten. We pray that you touch Randy Leonard and Maria Vojo, Andrew Parker, Brody Brown, 
At this time, we commit Bob Richie and the Richie family into your hands. We also pray for Ken Nicholas. We remember Lori Young. We pray that your healing hand will rest upon her. We pray for Will and Maggie Patterson. We pray for Reverend Julie Sivo and family. We commit the family of Isabel and nothing to you at this time as they mourn our departure. We pray that you strengthen them, comfort them, and encourage them. We also pray for the family of our reverend, our minister, Reverend Adekunle and family, and everyone that needs all our prayers. We pray that, Lord, do what nobody can do. I pray that, Lord, you touch every life here this morning. I pray that everyone under this anointing will fill your power this morning. I pray that your power, your grace, your strength will touch everyone. I pray that any area of our lives that you have lost, a loss of anything, I pray that Lord this morning will be found any areas of our life that you have been crying, I pray that you wipe away our tears. I pray that what you have proposed your word to do in our life, we do it. We pray for those that are crying wherever they might be, that you wipe away their tears. Those that have one challenges or the other that you intervene. We pray for our church that there shall be revival in the name of Jesus. And I pray that at the end of our race, every one of us we will inherit the kingdom of God. Thank you because you have done it. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. I can hear your amen. Amen. Uh, let's uh, take the Lord's prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us all our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And please, before we take the closing hymn, this Wednesday, we are starting our Advent Bible study. Please read the Wednesday writings. And we are going to meet 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock at the CE Center. And also, next Sunday, please prepare your dancing shoes. It's going to be powerful. What do I say? Your dancing shoes. It's going to be dance throughout, songs throughout. The palmers will be singing and I'm ready to dance. I will throw away my suit on that day and dance till just come and dance. Just do what? Dance. Come and dance and come and sing. Prepare yourself. And I know the glory of God will rest upon us. Yeah, if there are any other announcements during the week, we'll pass it to you. We want to welcome Peter and Janet. We want to welcome the Nigel, Nigel daughter. Thank you for worshiping with us. We want to welcome our, our pastor's uh, guest and everyone who are worshiping with us for the first time. If you are worshiping with us for the first time, please, the usher will give you this blue card. I want you to fill it. I would like to uh, be your friend, uh, talk to you, know more about you, and Please join us for our coffee and tea after the service. What else? Look round, look, look right and left and tell somebody, good morning. Good morning. No, no, that's not what I, I want you to do. Look right and shake somebody's <laughs> hand. Good morning. Yeah, shake somebody's hand by your right and by the left. Say, good morning. How are you doing? I love you. I love you. God bless you. Just make fun. Just make a friend this morning. Somebody you have never talked to. Somebody you have never talked to. Is there anybody you have never talked to in the church? Make friend with that person today. 
Tell him, oh, I love you. You are looking good. Okay. You are looking good. <laughs> okay, please let us take the closing hymn, Voices United, number 289. It only takes what is spark. 289. And as you are able, you may stand. And as we pass on the love that God has given us as individual and as a church, let us go out this morning spreading the joy, the love, and the peace of God to everyone near and around us. Let us take the commissioning and the benediction. Go in love and loyalty, knowing that Christ goes before you behind you, walks beside you, and lives within you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. I can hear your hymn. Amen. And our choral benediction is more voices number 48. I can feel you near me, God. you are not jumping. I will sing the chorus again. I want you to jump. Let's go. Come on, jump. Yes, good. I can see you jumping. God bless you and go out and serve the Lord.